All right, uh, so I'm going to be talking about two main topics, God willing, uh, and I, I really appreciate Rod's uh, speech because he kind of touched on something that I wanted to really talk about and kind of takes the pressure off of what I have to say, <laughs> so that was awesome. But anyways, so I'm going to be talking about shifting our focus to God and His message and uh, striving for one unified understanding. God willing, I'll transition those together. But before I get into it, uh, I, I, I'm not going to be talking too much about our focus should be on God. That will kind of be inadvertently uh, in the message of my speech. Uh, and uh, the, the, the inspiration for this was from the book uh, uh, Professor Daniel Kahneman wrote. He's a psychologist. He wrote this book about uh, the human brain and how uh, our critical thinking, our judgment and assessment of things are uh, it, it's divided into two systems, what he calls it. I think Karim Galit, he must have read the same book I wrote, so it's, he might know more about it than I do. Uh, but Oh, no way. Okay, never mind. That kind of gave it away. But anyways, so it's talking about system one and system two. System one is very fast, it's very emotional, and it's very intuitive. It, it relies on a lot of data, and it also relies on a lot of uh, instinct, instinctual answers and responses. And I'm going to go through a couple examples. One that you just already saw is a very cliche example, which is why I want to present it, because most people are familiar with it. And I'll provide one that's less popular. Uh, unless if you are in high school, you may have come across it. Uh, and we'll just, just quickly demonstrate uh, how important it is to understand the difference between these two systems and how I believe God uh, is, of course, well aware of this and He's giving us the utilities that we need via the Quran, via the commandments in the Quran, so that we can uh, use this uh, use these system to our advantage, as God willing. Um, so... Here is one example. Uh, oh, before I get into it, uh, it, your system one is going to keep yelling out the answer, and that's the that's the part I want you to focus on, right? So here's the example. This is the one that I'm I'm sure everyone is familiar with. It. Like where you know all the lines are the same length, right? However, your system one is keep yelling saying, "Hey, the second one is the longest. Second one is the longest, right?" But then your system two comes in and says, "Wait a minute. Let me measure this. I know this could be a trick question. I've seen this before. If you haven't, if you haven't seen it now, you know." And you think, okay, well, I'm going to measure this and I'm going to identify that they're the same exact length, right? This is something that I'm sure everyone has seen before. But even though you've seen it before, you can't help but have this like little voice saying, no, the second one is the longest, right? Because it obviously looks longer. Uh, here's another one. This is, uh, this is a very simple algebraic question. It says, a bat and ball cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? The response of most people is triggered is 10 cents, 10 cents, 10 cents. And this was actually an experiment given to Princeton University students and almost all of them in a certain time frame uh, that they were allowed, the response was 10 cents. When you actually solve it, you realize that the actual answer is 5 cents, right? And again, this is, uh, I don't want to get too deep into this because uh, in his book, Thinking Fast and Low, he covers a lot of different grounds, which uh, will in the interest of time, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I'll, talk, I'll shift over into uh, uh, what God talks about. However, before I jump into that, I want to also talk about another crucial uh, aspect of this, and which is priming effect. Uh, priming effect kind of is self-explanatory, but if, if, if it's not exactly clear, is if I tell you something without giving you a lot of information, without giving you any information, in fact, I can tell you something that c that's completely arbitrary, or I can tell you something that's very relevant to the topic that we're about to discuss. No matter what, and no matter how smart you think you are, you're going to be primed with something, okay? For instance, I can say, hey, there's someone that's going to walk into this store, and this person is a very mean person. The moment that person walks in, you're going to already be uh, a prime with, like, this person is mean, and you, you're going to have this sort of pre- judgment of this person without really knowing the whole story, right? And that's the priming effect. So uh, here's, here's a demonstration. <clears throat> so I'll say, hey, let's go eat some food. This is completely arbitrary, right? Let's go eat some food. And I'll say, what do you think this word says? Most people are going to say, oh, it's probably talking about soup, right? Because we're talking about food. And I'll say, all right, well, please wash your hands. And I'll show you the same word. What does it say? Most people are probably thinking, soap because you use soap to wash your hands. Even though it, it, the answer to the first one could have been soap, and the answer to this one could have been soup, right? But you were primed with something completely arbitrary that, however, influenced your ultimate decision, right? And this is important, because priming yourself with the right things in life 
is crucial. Uh, people in, in, in marketing uh, use this to their advantage. Com big companies use this to their advantage. Uh, a, a lot of industries do that. And it's, it's, it works very well, right? <clears throat> now, priming and training are two systems. So now we know that we have these two systems uh, that we can you know, utilize in, uh, for the better or for the worse. And we know that priming them will also help us either get better at something or worse at something, right? And here's what God does, and I believe is very, very important in the Quran. God gives us a set of commandments in the Quran, right? There, there are a bunch of commandments, and I'm just going to pinpoint some of them here. Uh, glorifying God before you sleep and when you wake up, chapter 30, verse 17. Force yourself to be with the believers. Reciting the Quran every, uh, every dawn, right? Contact prayers a lot. Plenty of verses talk about that. Mention God's name before you eat. Uh, God willing, when you're talking about any future events, uh, crediting God for your blessings, mashallah, right? <clears throat> and acknowledging that God is doing everything. So let's just pause here for a second. When I was reading this book, and then I started to think about what God says in the Quran, I came to one very obvious conclusion. God is obviously aware. He's the best psychologist. He knows exactly what he created. He knows exactly how we as human beings are wired, right? Uh, and he knows that if we observe his commandments, and there's a reason he's given us these commandments, first, we're going to be primed with something that's really positive. That's the number one thing. Even, I'm talking about at the beginning where your belief is not completely established. You're primed with something. Just by reading the Quran, you're automatically primed. And remember, we just pr provided evidence that even if it's something completely arbitrary, it still will have influence on you, right? And then, once your belief is obviously established and you observe the commandments, you are effectively training your system one and your system two. This is the part of uh, the system one, remember, was the part of your uh, system uh, where it, it's very intuitive and it makes very quick assessments and judgments. And, uh, and that, that's crucial for our well-being, for survival reasons, like if you're driving on the highway and you predict there's some danger coming up, you're very quick to, you know, swerve or stop. Uh, you know, we had a boss's uh, a, a speech where he talked about something like that, right? Whereas, uh, whereas system two is very slow and it says, okay, I, I got to actually assess this and go through some uh, 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 analysis before I can uh, uh, accurately judge this. But it's controlling because once it comes in, it'll uh, either agree with system one or if, if it disagrees, it'll overwrite that. And that's very important in the Quran because the more educated we are, hopefully our intuition and our instinctual responses will be righteous. And if we do make a mistake, God forbid, if we do make a mistake, we can, according to chapter 18, verse 103, examine ourselves. This is where system two is at work. And it takes effort. Uh, God says in, uh, I, I don't remember the verse, so if someone knows, shout out, but God says uh, we create a human being to work hard to redeem himself, right? Uh, so, so think about what that means, right? If I tell you, hey, uh, you have a job opportunity that's coming up at this company, at whatever, uh, Google, right? But for you to get in, it's going to take a tremendous amount of hard work, right? Uh, you're going to work very hard. If I say, hey, you have an opportunity to get into you know, MIT or Stanford University, whatever, right? Whatever your dream school is. You know how much hard work it takes because people have been telling you it takes a lot of hard work. Now, God is using those words. Work hard to redeem yourself. It takes a lot of effort uh, to self-examine, to uh, be crit critical towards yourself before you're critical towards anyone else, in fact. Um, and make sure that you're always on the right path, right? So keep, keep this in mind. I'm going to pause here for a second. I want to talk just kind of brief of what I've talked about so far, so hopefully I'm not losing anyone. Uh, God is priming us with positive information. He's giving us a lot of data that's in the Quran, a lot of information in the Quran that we can use to our advantage to train ourselves, to God willing, uh, make good judgments uh, that will favor the Quran. Right, and uh, and God has furthermore actually told us in some cases how to judge, right? Which is very very important. Now, what I want to talk about, kind of transition into, is the one unified understanding that we should all strive for. Okay. This verse comes to mind. God says He sent down to you the Scripture containing straightforward verses, which constitutes the essence of the Scripture. I'll pause here for a second. As if it's not enough to acknowledge the fact that since the source is one and the same, which is God, 
uh, that should already infer that there could only be one correct understanding. And we should all strive for that. We should all work hard knowing how we, uh, knowing ourselves as human beings, and instead of thinking, oh, well, you know, uh, I had a certain problem with this person or this community or whatever, and I'm going to discard what they say. Make your system too hard at work, be self-critical, examine yourself like God says, and use the Quran to make the judgments, not your own emotion, not your own uh, intuition, especially if it's wrong, correct? The one unified understanding is very clear in the Quran in this verse, in my opinion, right? Because it says these straightforward verses constitute the essence of the scripture. The essence means the most crucial part of the scripture, right? The most, God's saying the most, most crucial part of the scripture are straightforward verses. Straightforward verses could not possibly be interpreted any other way. They're very, very direct. There is only one correct understanding and that's it, right? So I'll give you an example. Uh, God says, and, and like uh, straightforward verses, I think about those verses are always commandments, right? There are other verses that are straightforward, but the commandments are always straightforward because they're necessary for our salvation. God would not ever give us commandments that could be open to interpretation or ambiguous or anything like that, right? So when God says, uh, uh, like, don't steal, don't lie, right? No one's going to sit there and be like, well, you know, God says, don't lie. I can still white lie here and there. It's okay if I lie to this person. It's okay. I, I'm in a job interview. It's intense. If I slip a lie, it's okay. You know when God says don't lie, it means don't lie. God's not talking about black lie, white lie, purple lie, or anything like that, right? It's just don't, don't lie at all, right? And those are straightforward verses. And God's saying, look, that is the essence of the scripture. Now, here's the interesting part. It says, as well as, uh, as, well as the multiple meaning or allegorical verses. That, so, Quran uh, contains more. Those who harbor doubts in their hearts will pursue multiple meaning verses to create confusion and to extricate a certain meaning. None knows the true meaning thereof except God and those well found, founded in knowledge. So God's saying even when it comes to multiple meaning verses and allegorical verses, there's true meaning to those verses that only those whom God has chosen know the true meaning thereof, which means there's still one unified understanding. So when we strive and work hard together to... Uh, our goal is to for one unified understanding. This isn't because we're in a system of brainwash. This isn't because we have leaders that we want to follow. This is because there is only one true understanding. And if we have two different understandings on same topics, for certain, someone's wrong, right? And our focus should be on God and his message, not the persons or the messenger. <clears throat> I'm not sure what the next slides are, so I have to keep looking here. Uh, okay, so here, here's, a, here's a good example. The message, proof of messengership. That is chapter 7, verse 75. Uh, it, it reads, the arrogant leaders among his people said to the common people who believed, how do you know that Saul is sent by his Lord? They said the message he brought has made us believers. This, is the, this should be the response of every righteous person. You're not going to go on YouTube and watch someone talk and be like, oh, because I like this person, I'm going to accept whatever they say. Or because I don't like this person, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reject what they say or cherry pick what they're saying, right? In fact, God himself talks about this in the Quran, that there are verses in the Quran which you may not like, right? You may not like some verses in the Quran because the, it's a command or a certain information that doesn't sit well with you. But if you're a righteous person, you're going to say, yes, sir, we hear and we obey and overcome that because you give your ego up and you kill your ego in favor of accepting God. It's absolute authority. Uh, there are a couple more examples. Uh, this is, I believe, about Saul when they were questioning God's wisdom. That was in the, uh, in the question, right, in the Jeopardy question. So Saul is not a prophet. Uh, but in the Jeopardy question was this, right? Uh, they asked for a king. God appointed someone to be their king, and then they said, well, we don't want this guy to be our king because he's not even rich. That was their assessment. And again, this is their intuition because they have been primed their entire life to think a king has to be rich. And what God is teaching us is that there's more to kingship than wealth. You need to have certain skill set. Each person here has, needs to have certain skill set to be able to carry out a task. God's messenger of the covenant, for instance, had to ha be a professional researcher. Think about it, right? He had a PhD in biochemistry. That means he was a researcher for years, and he had, he had experience. He was trained uh, and understood how to uh, adequately and 
uh, uh, do good research, right? And when he came to unveil the mathematical miracle of the Quran, he had to have those prior training, right? He didn't have to be rich. Wealth doesn't help at that point to unveil the, you know, something that's hidden in the Quran. Uh, another example is these people that mock God, uh, mock the believers to the extent that they forgot God. That's in 23, 109 through 110. Uh, these people were so focused. And the way I understand this verse, by the way, these are people who actually believed in God's existence. Like they believe in God for sure, because that's what they said to the point they forgot God. So they knew who, they knew that there was God, and they were aware of that. But they were so busy mocking certain individuals for whatever reason, for whatever influences they had in their lives, that they actually forgot God. Uh, and and so what I want to conclude here is, inshallah, we should be well aware. In the Quran, God makes it very clear that there is only one correct understanding of whatever verse, commandment in the Quran you can think of. There's only one correct understanding. And if you find yourself in a situation where you're disagreeing with, with believers, right? You're in a Quran study or whatever situation, you're disagreeing with believers. Take a step back. Don't take it personal. Don't let it uh, become a personal matter. We're here to discuss really God's business, not ours. This isn't something that we're not, we didn't unveil God's message. We're not here to add or take away from the revelations. We're only here to hopefully get to the truth and do what pleases God the most, right? And we should prime ourselves with those positive messages that are in the Quran. We should work hard and God willing get to the point where our focus is always on the message and not the messenger or the people that are discussing it. Um, that's, that's the end of my speech. Question, oh, mashallah, no yeah. comments. Anyone have any questions? You can do comments, I mean, mashallah, just as long as they're concise and, you know, to the point. Anybody? Did I scare everyone from talking? <laughs> okay, mashallah. Here. Amir, yeah, I just want to make a comment, you know, because when, when you were talking, it reminded me um, in the appendix, uh, at the end of appendix two, it talks about mercy from God. I'll just read this couple of sentences. It says, when the believers are faced with a problem, they develop a number of possible solutions. And this invariably leads to considerable bickering, disunity, and disarray, right? So it says, we learn from 2151, 3164, and 2107 that it is but mercy from God that he sends to us messengers to provide the final solutions to our problems. So I just wanted to point that out, that, yeah, there's going to be, you know, what's the final solution? God has sent a messenger to give that one understanding that one solution to that way if we have multiple understandings it's done okay. i just wanted to add that maybe you should give the speech you know, so <laughs> that hit the nail on the head all that work on psychology and you just read the pen <laughs> yeah, great um anybody else have any comments or questions all right wow we're early now okay cool Much <laughs>